Terry taught the nutrition course that I took last summer, and I was blown away by not only her depth of knowledge, but also how she shared success stories with clients to help tie it all together. As I'm currently studying homeopathy and loving every second, I thought it would be fun to get Carrie on to delve into this practice with me. And we're going to talk about all things nutrition in this segment. So Carrie, welcome. Hey. Nice to be here. Uh, well, it's so great to see you. And thanks for sharing your time with me. I know you're super, super busy. Um, no problem. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> oh, well, me too. So I just, uh, I hope Good. other people love to listen, particularly tying in nutrition and homeopathy. So tell us how it all ties in together. Um, nutrition is the foundation of health, which is something basic that we understand. Um, and without proper nutrition, we obviously can't be healthy because nutrition is the building blocks of what we need. I see homeopathy as the guide for what to tell our bodies what to do with all of those building blocks. So all of that building material. So um, great, even perfect nutrition is not enough if your body doesn't know what to do with it or if your body is not doing the right things with it. So very often I found in my practice that people can keep symptoms at bay with really you know, kind of perfect nutrition for them but they don't actually get better. They're just holding their symptoms at bay because they're not irritating or disturbing their system in any way. And if they deviate from their proper diet or their acceptable foods, then the symptoms return. I also see that even over time, even as they're holding their perfect diet, their symptoms uh, keep cropping up and their sensitivities keep getting worse. So they have to start eliminating more and more foods out of their diet. Um, and more and more extraordinary nu nutritional supports are needed because the nutrition is there, but their body's not doing the right things with it. So this is where I, I love homeopathy because it creates the blueprint and it helps the body figure out a better way to do something with all of that really great nutrition that people have in their systems. Conversely, homeopathy can't help someone if they're not eating any vegetables and they don't have, and they have scurvy, right? There's not, I can't make scurvy go away just with homeopathy. You have to have the building block. So it's that combination of the two things. You've got all the building materials, but then your body needs to do the right things with them. So with the nutrition and with the homeopathy, we can actually get that complete picture and stimulate the healing your body needs to do. Yeah. Homeopathy is not a magic bullet. You need no. to be doing the right thing. You need to be hydrating. You need to be eating the right foods and, and, um, among other things, but we're, uh, right. So that was a great point you made how some people can eat certain foods and be just fine. And some people can't. Yeah, so I'd love to explore that a little further with you, um, regarding food allergies and food sensitivities and food intolerance and what the difference is between those and why some people have issues with food and others do not. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of, um, I want to say controversy, but I've actually seen MDs deny that food sensitivities and food intolerances exist, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, food allergies are pretty clear and this is what MDs are very comfortable with working with. So food allergies are what we think of when we see, or we hear about anaphylaxis. Um, it's a histamine response. That's the IgE antibodies. And that is a big immune response. It tends to happen almost immediately. Um, and it doesn't have to be overly dramatic, but it does happen every single time someone consumes the food. So it could be something like hives or the lips swell up, the inside of the mouth swells, stomach cramping, or it can actually be as severe as an anaphylactic reaction. The key there is that it happens instantly and it happens every single time somebody eats the food. And food so, sensitivities are very difficult to diagnose because it's a very delayed reaction. In the body, we can actually see something called an IgG or an IgA response, but it can be up to 72 hours after eating the food that your body can have the reaction to the food. So trying to correlate what food is irritating you and the response that you're getting from that food is very, very tricky. Um, and it's really, especially in kids, it's so hard to try to find a pattern between what they're eating and the symptoms that they're manifesting, especially because the reactions can vary based on the amount of food that you've eaten, um, the health of your uh, in GI tract at the time. So the more stressed out your stomach is and the less healthy it is, you can just have a tiny bit of the food and your whole system is going to go crazy. 
general stress um, in your system. So if you're having a really bad day and you have a tiny bit of the food, your whole system is going to react. But if you're on vacation, you could probably eat a whole portion of that food and not have too much of a problem. Mm -hmm. Alcohol makes a difference because it weakens your GI tract. Various medications um, can have that. So if you've had an aspirin or Tylenol or something like that, that can increase your sensitivity to the food. And then other inflammatory conditions. If you have a pre-existing cold or a flu, or you're not feeling well, and then you have some of that food, your reaction is going to be much bigger than if your system was healthy. So trying to actually figure out what you're sensitive to and what's creating a problem in your system can be very tricky. The third category, which is a food intolerance. This one's a little bit easier to diagnose, and that generally is associated often with an enzyme deficiency. So the best example is lactose. Um, a lot of healthy adults, it's not an, uh, it's not a sign of ill health um, if you can't digest lactose. Most, Most of us can't digest dairy well, unfermented dairy, I should add. We can't digest unfermented dairy well. And that's simply because um, the adult body doesn't produce that much of a lactase enzyme. So that's a food intolerance. You lack the uh, enzyme required to break the food down. However, Having said that, people can develop food intolerances if they have poor GI health and their body stops producing the digestive enzymes they need to break down even the simplest of foods. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, you might've heard of the FODMAPS diet. Yeah. To me, um, that diet can be very beneficial, but it's a Band-Aid diet mm -hmm. because essentially you're eliminating foods that your body is lacking the enzymes to digest. Your body should be able to break down those foods. So something has damaged your GI tract and you no longer are able to break down those foods properly. That is a food intolerance, but that kind of food intolerance is not something you should take lightly because something has upset your system and mm -hmm. you're no longer able to digest something that you should be able to digest. Unlike dairy, dairy okay. is, is pretty much across the board, um, particularly Asian cultures. Um, can't digest dairy. Essentially, a food intolerance um, is an indication that there's something going on in your GI tract that it's not as robust as it should be, mm. and that there the food that you're eating is stimulating either irritation in the GI tract itself, or your GI tract is so damaged that the food is getting through the GI tract into your bloodstream and creating systemic issues throughout the whole body. Mm. So that could be things as um, a lot of people get congestion, sinus issues, or they'll get headaches. They'll feel generalized fatigue, uh, aching and pain in the joints. Um, and for children, often bedwetting mm. because there's an inflammation of the urinary tract. Mm. The urinary tract becomes inflamed. They don't have as much urinary control and they end up wetting the bed at night. Okay, so what would be some ways to fortify your gut? Right. So great ways. Um, I think it depends on it depends on exactly what has been going on. So some people only develop food sensitivities post antibiotic use. Mm. So if it's that quick and that like if it's a really short time frame afterwards, um, then fairly aggressive protocols of fermented foods and probiotics is probably enough to put you back on track. If the food sensitivity has been around for a long period of time, um, it becomes a little bit more complicated. So there isn't a pat answer for everyone mm -hmm. um, because it depends on how extensive the damage to the GI tract is and how sensitized your body is to that food. So the, the food allergies itself that we touched upon in the beginning that could be you're allergic to cashews or you have a, a, a massive reaction to nuts mm. or eggs or whatnot. Are those something that are treatable through homeopathy? <clears throat> yeah, for some people it is. Um, especially if the, and we see this uh, generationally, if we see that that food allergy um, is in a child's and the parents have food sensitivities, food allergies, or interestingly, skin conditions. So if you have two parents that have chronic eczema and they end up with a child that has um, very strong food allergies, we can often treat the child. And I'm not going to suggest that they can go out and eat bowls full of shrimp, 
but they will be less likely to have an anaphylaxic type reaction. So at the very least, what we find is that we can tamp down the reaction so that the reaction will become something like an itchy hive. Wow. versus a full-on anaphylactic reaction. If what you're getting right now is hives, then likely we can tamp that down so that it will disappear entirely. Wow. Yeah. Phenomenal. So another thing that uh, came up in the nutrition course, because I really, really enjoyed that deep dive, um, was about babies and how we really shouldn't be feeding them any starches until their back molars have formed. Can you Walk me through this. Uh, I know there will be a lot of people interested in this and, and understand what happens later in life, potentially to kids that are eating a lot of starches and in, in when they're babies. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. The, um, I know that for, for a very long period of time, um, babies first food, uh, the recommended first food was starches like rices and grains and and various things that pablum <laughs> that they would suggest <laughs> yeah. for babies right that box of pablum that you mix with water um and there's unfortunately a lot of people that are still recommending that children babies i should say not children babies um are really great at digesting fat protein and milk sugars for obvious reasons. This is what mother's milk is, right? So breast milk is really, really high in fat. It's got protein and it's got milk sugar. So their entire body is designed for that. The one thing that mother's milk does not have is starch. And there's a difference between starches and carbohydrates. Carbohydrates is a whole group of nutrients and sugar is a part of that. Another branch of a carbohydrate food group is starches. Babies are not able to digest starch. They're missing something called amylase, which is a digestive enzyme. Um, in adults, we produce most of it in our mouth, and it's salivary amylase. So it's not in infants. It's not present until about six months of age. They don't produce any salivary amylase. The other place we get amylase from is our pancreas. So after we've chewed the food, swallowed it, and it goes into our digestive tract, um, our pancreas then adds some more amylase uh, into that whole mix to help break down those starches farther. For infants, they don't start di uh, developing any pancreatic amylase until they're about 28 to 36 months old. So not until their molars come in. So that means that if you feed an infant starch, their body is not breaking it down. And those undigested starches are making it through their stomach and then into the digestive tract. And when you have undigested food in places that it's not supposed to be, it can wreck a lot of havoc in the system. It can damage the very delicate mucosal membranes. And the other really big thing that it does is it damages or it upsets the microbiota. So if you're putting starch into your body or into your intestines, then you start breeding bacteria that breaks down starch. And those bacteria are not supposed to be there. So the whole microbiota gets upset because the right kind of bacteria are not in the places that they're supposed to be. And you have these other bacteria doing the wrong jobs in the wrong places. Uh, there's always controversy around these things. So one of the things that I've seen that's very misleading is they're conflating carbohydrates and starches. Mm. So some, some research that was put out saying, you don't have to worry about it. Babies are great at digesting carbohydrates. Mm. They are, they're great at digesting milk sugars from breast milk. They are not great at breaking down the starches in rice. Yeah. Those are two very different things. One's a polysaccharide and the other one is a very simple sugar that's easy to break down. Wow. The other thing that I've seen is they say, you know, traditionally cultures around the world have fed grains to children, but they've ignored two very key cultural uh, practices. One is fermenting grains. So the fermentation process breaks down the starches and turns them into sugars or into proteins, and then the babies are digesting that. So they're not digesting a raw grain. It's a fermented grain. Right. What's an example they, of a fermented grain? Oh, a fermented grain. Um, well, there's sourdough is probably the most common and easy one to understand. So we use a bacterial culture, a bacteria and yeast culture to eat the starches out of wheat 
Um, and in the process, they bubble and ferment and they do a bunch of things like that. So in other cultures, they'll ferment rices, they'll have fermented porges, um, they'll even ferment oats and various things like that. And then those become usually breakfast foods or like a pablum, but it's been sitting on the counter, bubbling and fermenting and getting a whole bunch of beneficial probiotic uh, bacteria and yeast cultures in that. And then that's what the babies and really the whole family is eating. Right. Um, so pre-digested versus- It's pre-digested yeah. by the bacteria. Right. And so that pre-digested uh, means that the baby isn't actually ingesting the starch. They're ingesting the beneficial bacterial culture that has eaten all the starch. Yeah. That's a very different food now. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's an amazing explanation. And then when you think about what other people, what, what other options are for babies that that's on the counter in the grocery store, it's the baby food and that's full of corn starch and fillers yes. and rice starch. So, you know, you're not just feeding them a jar of, I don't know, squash. It's got all these fillers in it. That that yeah. It's been thickened with starches. It is, it is nice to see that health Canada, um, it does or no longer recommends pablum as the first or cereals as the first food. They do recommend that fruits and vegetables should be the baby's first food. Okay. So we're slowly starting to see this shift right. and we're slowly starting to see that people are recognizing that this is a concern um, and that baby's systems are not designed to eat cereals as their first food. So for kids that have grown up um, eating the starches at a young age, because we you know, we didn't know better. Yeah. Um, does this lead to food allergies and sensitivities later in life? Yeah, that's the big concern is that it can, um, that, or more significantly, possibly autoimmune dis disorders. Mm -hmm. So it's that idea that if you haven't established the right microbiota and babies are born without a microbiota. That's what breast milk is for. And the first few years of their lives, some people say up to seven years of their lives, it takes them to really establish a strong microbiota. So if you're feeding the wrong bacteria in the wrong places of the body, then your intestinal health is not going to be robust because it is that microbiota that protects our intestines and actually does really cool things like um, metabolizes vitamin B so that actually generates vitamin B for us. It generates vitamin K for us, but that has to be a healthy, robust microbiota. And if you haven't established that when you're young, then that is the concern that you've allowed the wrong bacteria to grow in the wrong places. The other uh, big concern is that babies naturally have leaky gut. And it's a good thing that babies have leaky gut because that's how they get antibodies from the mom. Right. Mm -hmm. They ingest breast milk and the good antibodies from the mom actually pass through the digestive tract and into the body. But if you're feeding the baby things that it can't digest properly, then those food particles that are undigested in places they shouldn't be can actually also get into the body and lead to inflammatory conditions um, and frequent illnesses and infections. So in, in clinic, that looks like frequent ear infections, skin rashes, like diaper rash. That's a big one. If you started to feed your baby solids and they start getting diaper rash very badly, stop, stop with the pablums, stop with the starches, because that's likely what the problem is. Um, so you see the sinus congestions, and then you also see the asthma and the respiratory issues develop because there's food particles in the bloodstream stimulating an immune response and a systemic in inflammation process in the baby. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it all leads back to diet. Yeah. So we're, we are seeing a lot, as you mentioned, autoimmune inflammatory mm -hmm. diseases on the rise. I know for adults, what we see is that really poor GI health in general is linked with autoimmune issues for sure, without question. I also see a strong link between suppressive medications and treatments Essentially, you keep trying to shut off the immune system and suppress the expression of the disease symptoms, and eventually the immune system wears out and your body becomes very tired. So then you start developing the autoimmune conditions and then also the exposure to increased toxins. So to kind of break those down a bit with the GI health, antibiotic use is a big one as well. Absolutely massive. Um, in infants, 
in adults, in agriculture, there's antibiotics are everywhere. And those just directly damage the GI tract so that healthy defense system is destroyed and you no longer have that first line of defense in your system. The A lot of people don't really know this, but the there's something called the GALT system in our GI tract, and it's the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, which is a really fancy way of saying it's your immune system. Mm. There's about 70% of your immune system is in your digestive tract, Wow, which makes sense because this is where we take stuff from the outside and we put it into our body deliberately. So of course, our body has fortified that entire area with a, an immune system so that any pathogens that are coming into our system, our body can recognize them right away, uh, defend us against them and ex- excrete them all very efficiently and nicely without us even recognizing it. Mm-hmm. But as soon as we damage um, that the, the, um, the entire immune system down there, which is mostly the microbiota, the healthy microbiota, as soon as we damage that, then we lose a huge part of our immune system. So then with that, our bodies are no longer able to defend us properly and our immune systems become hypersensitized, uh, overreactive, and basically overworked because all that we have left then is the spleen and the lymph nodes and the bone marrow, which sounds like a lot, except the gut immune system overshadows all of that. We then also eat food that's really bad for us. And not always intentionally, even basic bread that you get often has chemicals in it that are known to damage the immune system and the GI tract at the same time. So then that will, of course, lead to a greater chance of an autoimmune disorder. With the suppressive medications, it kind of comes down then to, you know, we, our GI tract is damaged. We're not feeling very well. Uh, We go seeking help. Um, And then we get prescribed something like something as simple as a, an antacid or, you know, or something more extreme or they'll give us um, something to help with constipation, or they'll give us something, something that suppresses the symptom and doesn't actually address that root cause. Mm -hmm. So the damage then keeps occurring. We're just less aware that the damage is continually occurring in our system until we have a more catastrophic breakdown. Right. So that antacid might take away that heartburn or the, the stomach bloating. Right. But it, so you feel better. You think, oh, it's working. I feel great. I can get on with things. But that's leading to a whole host of, of other stuff that's going to crumb up and it's going to be much more detrimental. Exactly. And you're, you're never addressing the idea about why were you having heartburn from eating basic real food in the first place, your body should be able to handle that. And if it can't handle that, that indicates that there's something wrong with your GI tract. And over the long term, that damage is going to keep occurring, you know, autoimmune conditions and the exposure to toxins is really well documented. So we see a lot of endocrine disruptors, we see bio, um, bioaccumulating chemicals um, in our environment and people with autoimmune disorders tend to test higher for these chemicals than people without autoimmune disorders. And we're seeing those autoimmune disorders show up younger and younger. We're seeing more and more children that have unhealthy GI systems. Right. Their GI tracts are not strong. We're seeing heartburn in 12 year olds. Right, that's crazy. If you're at the point where you have a lot of symptoms. Um, and this is where I think a lot of people get stuck when people feel unwell, they have very little energy because just everything feels like it's too much. And so the idea of reaching out and getting help from someone feels like it's such a big deal that they're going to have to explain something to someone. And that person might not believe them or might tell them that it's normal or that it's okay, or tell them that, you know, well, now you have to throw everything out of your fridge and you can't eat any, you have to eat this very prescribed diet. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not the kind of help that you need. What you need is you need someone that's going to work with you at the place that you're at, someone who's going to look at the root cause of those problems so that you can have more energy so that you can make more change. It's actually one of the reasons that I wanted to have the start the platform that I started was just to get these people who are struggling to figure out what steps do I need to take? I don't feel that well. I'm not getting the support from my conventional doctor. Yeah. This is a place they can maybe go and get little tips and tidbits and maybe see some experts in the field that can kind of help direct them the right into the right place and, and know that they can, they can turn it around. We all have our own health destiny in our hands. And, and sometimes it's, it's just a matter of taking the time to figure out where, where to start. Yeah. And that's, 
I find it distressing the number of times, particularly from women that have come to see me out of desperation because they've gone to their conventional doctors and they're told that what they need is an antidepressant because they're tired and they don't have energy and they're not, they're struggling through their days. And that's not the answer. So many other things that you can do to increase your health, to help your, to feel better so that you have the energy to start making different decisions. I so love talking to you and hearing everything that you have to share and the nutrition piece and the homeopathy piece, or they really go hand in hand as, really as there's nutrition with everything. Right. So yeah. um, I really appreciate you shedding some light and talking about starch and, and feeding our babies and, and giving them the best start that they can have for, uh, to live a, a healthier life. So it's thank important. you. Yeah. You're welcome. So much. I really appreciate it, Carrie. It was a lot of fun. Thanks.